The subject of this seminar is the veil of thoughts. And uh, following out the theme that somebody once suggested by saying that thought is a means of concealing truth. Despite the fact that it's an extraordinarily useful faculty. But in quite recent weeks, we've had an astounding example of the way mankind can be bamboozled by thoughts. Uh, there was a crisis about gold. And uh, the confusion of money in any form whatsoever with wealth is one of the major problems from which civilization is suffering. Because way back in our development, when we first began to use symbols to represent the events of the physical world, we found this such an ingenious device that we became completely fascinated with it. And in ever so many different dimensions of life, we are living in a state of total confusion between symbol and reality. And the real reason why in our world today where uh, there is no technical reason whatsoever why there should be any poverty at all, the reason it still exists is people keep asking the question, where's the money going to come from? Not realizing that money doesn't come from anywhere and never did except if you thought it was gold. And then, of course, uh, if to increase the supply of gold, use that to finance all the world's commerce, prosperity would depend not upon finding new processes for growing food in vast quantities, or getting uh, nutrition out of the ocean, or uh, getting water from atomic energy. No, it depends on discovering a new gold mine. And uh, you can see what a nonsensical state of affairs that is. Because when gold is used for money, it becomes, in fact, useless. Gold is very useful metal for filling teeth, making jewelry, and maybe covering the dome of the Capitol in Washington. But the moment it is locked up in vaults in the form of ingots, it becomes completely useless. It becomes a false security, something that people cling to, like an idol, like a belief in some kind of big daddy oh god with whiskers who lives above the clouds. And all, all that kind of thing uh, diverts our attention from reality. We go through all sorts of weird rituals and uh, get in uh, the symbol, in other words, gets in the way of uh, practical life. So, uh, it was, you remember the Great Depression? I expect a number of you here looking around are old enough to remember the Great Depression. When uh, one day everybody was doing business and things were going along pretty well, and the next day there were bread lines. Uh, it was like someone came to work and they said to him, Sorry, chum, but you can't build today. No, no building can go on. We don't have enough inches. He said, what do you mean we don't have enough inches? We got wood, haven't we? We got metal, we even got tape measures. He said, yeah, but you don't understand the business world. Uh, we just haven't got enough inches, just plain inches. Uh, we've used too much of them. And that's exactly what happened when we had the Depression. Because money is something of the same order of reality as inches, grams, meters, pounds, or lines of latitude and longitude. It is an abstraction. It is a method of bookkeeping to obviate the cumbersome procedures of barter. But our culture, our civilization, is entirely hung up on the notion that money has an independent reality of its own. And this is a very striking, concrete example of what I'm going to talk about of the 
way we are bamboozled by our thoughts, which are symbols, and uh, what we can do to become unbamboozled, because it's a very serious state of affairs. Uh, most of our political squabbles are entirely the result of being bamboozled by thinking. And it is to be noted that as time goes on, the matters about which we fight with each other are increasingly abstract. And the, the wars fought about abstract problems get worse and worse. We are uh, thinking about vast abstractions, ideologies called communism, capitalism, uh, all these systems and paying less and less attention to the world of physical reality, to the world of earth, and trees, and waters, people, and so are in the name of all sorts of abstractions busy destroying our natural environment. Wildlife, for example, is having a terrible problem continuing to exist alongside human beings. Another example of this fantastic confusion is that not so long ago, the Congress voted a law imposing stern penalties upon anyone who should presume to burn the American flag. And they put this law through with a great deal of patriotic oratory and the quoting of poems and so on about old glory. Uh, ignoring the fact entirely that these same congressmen, by acts of commission or omission, are burning up that for which the flag stands. They are allowing the utter pollution of our waters, of our atmosphere, the devastation of our forests, and uh, the increasing power of the bulldozer to bring about a ghastly fulfillment of the biblical prophecy that every valley shall be exalted, every mountain laid low, and the rough places plain. But you see, they don't see, they don't notice the difference between the flag and the country. Well, as Kozhybski pointed out, the difference between the map and the territory. Now, however, I think we should begin by talking a little bit about when we use the word physical reality as distinct from abstraction, what are we talking about? Because you see, there's going to be a fight about this, philosophically. If I say that the, the final reality that we are living in is the physical world, a lot of people will say that I'm a materialist, that I'm unspiritual, and that uh, I think too much of an identification of the man with the body. You, any, any book that you open on yoga or uh, Hindu philosophy will have in it a uh, declaration that you start a meditation practice by saying to yourself, I am not the body. I am not my feelings. I am not my thoughts. I am the witness who watches all this and is not really any of it. And so if I were to say then that the physical world is the basic reality, I would seem to be contradicting what is said in these Hindu texts. But um, it all depends on what you mean by the physical world. What is it? First of all, let us be pointed out that the idea of the material world is itself philosophical. It is in its, uh, in its own way a symbol. And so if I take up something that uh, is generally agreed to be something in the material world, and I argue that this is material, of course it isn't. Because nobody has ever been able to put their finger on anything material. That is to say, if you buy the word material, you mean some sort of basic stuff out of which the world is made by, say, analogy with the art of ceramics, pottery. Uh, we use clay and we form it into various shapes. And so a lot of people think that the physical world is various forms of matter. And nobody has ever been able to discover any matter. 
They've been able to discover various forms, yes, various patterns, but no, no matter. You can't even think of what, how you would describe matter in some terms other than form. Because whenever a physicist talks about the nature of the world, he describes a, a form, he describes a process, which can be put into the shape of a mathematical equation. And so if you say A plus B equals B plus A, everybody knows exactly what you mean. It's a perfectly clear statement. But nobody needs to ask, what do you mean by A or what do you mean by B? Or if you say one plus two equals three, that's perfectly clear. But you don't need to know one what, two what, or three what. And all our descriptions of the physical world have the nature of these formulae, numbers. They are simply mathematical patterns, because what we're talking about is pattern. But it's pattern of such a high degree of complexity that it's very difficult to deal with it by thinking. In science, uh, we really work in two different ends of the spectrum of reality. We can deal with problems in which there are very few variables. Or we can deal with problems in which there are almost infinitely many variables. But in between, we are pretty helpless. In other words, the average person cannot think through a problem involving more than three variables without a pencil in his hand. That's why, for example, it's difficult uh, to learn complex music. Think uh, of an organist who has two keyboards or three keyboards for work with his hands, and each hand is doing a different rhythm. And then his feet on the pedals, he could be doing a different rhythm with each foot. Now that's a different, difficult thing for people to learn to do. Just like to rub your stomach in a circle and pat your head at the same time takes a, a, a little skill. Now, uh, most problems with which we deal in everyday life involve far more than three variables. And uh, we are really incapable of thinking about them. Actually, the way we think about most of our problems is simply going through the motions of thinking. We don't really think about them. We, we, we do most of our decision-making by hunch. You can collect data about a decision that you have to make, but the data that you collect has the same sort of relation to the actual processes involved in this decision as a uh, skeleton to a living body. It's just the bones. And there are all sorts of entirely unpredictable possibilities involved in every decision. And uh, you, you don't really think about it at all. The truth of the matter is that um, we are as successful as we are, which is surprising uh, the degree to which we are successful in conducting our everyday practical lives because our brains do the thinking for us in an entirely unconscious way. The brain uh, is far more complex than any computer. The brain is in fact the most complex known object in the universe because our neurologists don't understand it. They have a very primitive conception of the brain and admit it. And therefore, if we do not understand our own brains, that simply shows that our brains are a great deal more intelligent than we are. Uh, meaning by we, the thing that we have identified ourselves with. Instead of being sensible and identifying ourselves with our brains, we identify ourselves with a very small operation of the brain, which is the faculty of conscious attention, which is a sort of radar that we have that scans the environment for unusual features. And we think we are that, and we are nothing of the kind. That's just a little, uh, little trick we do. So actually, our brain is analyzing all sensory input all the time. 
analyzing all the things you don't notice, don't think about, don't have even names for. And so it is this marvelous complex goings on which is responsible for our being able to adapt ourselves intelligently to the rest of the physical world. The brain is furthermore an operation of the physical world. But now you see though we get back to this question. Physical world. This is a concept. This is simply an idea. And uh, if you want to ask me to differentiate between the physical and the spiritual, I will not put the spiritual in the same class as the abstract, but most people do. They think that one plus two equals three is a proposition of a more spiritual nature than say, for, for example, a tomato. <laughs> but I think a tomato is a lot more spiritual than one plus two equals three. This is where we really get to the point. That's why in Zen Buddhism, when people ask what is the fundamental principle of Buddhism, you could very well answer a tomato. <laughs> because uh, look how, when you, when you examine the material world, how diaphanous it is. It really isn't very solid. A tomato doesn't last very long. Nor, for that matter, do the things that we consider most uh, exemplary of physical reality, such as mountains. The poet says, the hills are shadowed, and they flow from form to form, and nothing stands. Because the physical world is diaphanous. It's like music. When you play music, it simply disappears. There's nothing left. And that, for that very reason, it is one of the highest and most spiritual of the arts because it is the most transient. And so, in a way, you might say that transiency is a mark of spirituality. A lot of people think the opposite, that the spiritual things are the everlasting things. But you see, the, only, uh, the, the more a thing tends to be permanent, the more it tends to be lifeless. Uh, nothing is so dead as a diamond. And yet, the, this imagery, the idea of the most mineral objects being the most permanent, and so they get associated with the spiritual. Jesus Christ is called the Rock of Ages. And even the Buddhists have used the diamond, the Vajra, as an image of the fundamental reality of the universe. But the reason why they used the diamond was not that it was hard, but that it was completely transparent and therefore afforded a symbol of the void, which everything fundamentally is. Uh, not meaning that there simply is nothing there, but the void means that you cannot get any idea which will sufficiently define physical reality. Every idea will be wrong, and in that sense it will be void. So then, the, the physical world, we can't even find any stuff out of which it's made. We can only recognize each other. And I say, well, I realize that I met you before and that I see you again. But the thing that I recognize is not um, anything really except a consistent pattern. Let's suppose I have a rope. And this rope begins by being manila rope. Then it goes on by being cotton rope. Then it goes on with being nylon. Then it goes on with being silk. So I tie a knot in the rope. And I move the knot down along the rope. Now is it as it moves along the same knot or a different knot? We would say it was the same because you recognize the pattern of the knot. But at one point it's manila, at another point it's cotton, at another point it's nylon, and another it's silk. And that's just like us. We are recognized by the fact that one day you, you face the same way as you did the day before. And people recognize you're facing. 
So they say that's John Doe or Mary Smith. But actually the contents of your face, uh, whatever they may be, the water, the carbons, the chemicals, are changing all the time. You're like a whirlpool in a stream. The stream is doing this consistent whirlpooling and we always recognize, like at the uh, Niagara, the, the whirlpool is one of the sites. But the water is always moving on. And we are just like that and everything is like that. So the, there's, there's nothing in the physical world that is what you might call substantial. It's pattern. And this is why it's so spiritual. To be non-spiritual is not to see that. In other words, it is to impose upon the physical world the idea of thingness, of substantiality. That is to be, uh, in, the, 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 in the sense that the Hindus use it, that is to be involved in matter, to identify with the body. To believe, in other words, that the body is something constant something um, tangible. The body is really very intangible. You cannot pin it down. It's all falling apart furthermore. And we're aging, getting older. And uh, so therefore, if you cling to the body, you will be frustrated. So the whole point is that the material world, the world of nature is marvelous. So long as you don't try to lean on it so long as you don't cling to it. And if you don't cling to it, you can have a wonderful time. Let's take very, a very uh, uh, controversial issue. Uh, all spiritual people are generally against lovemaking. Ramakrishna used to speak about the evils of woman and gold. I've already demonstrated the evils of gold. <laughs> But what about the evils of woman? In my point of view, yes, women can be a source of evil if you attempt to possess them. I mean, if you can say of another person, I love you so much I want to own you, and really tie you down, and uh, call you, well, it's like that poem of Ogden Nash, where someone claimed that he loved his wife so much that he climbed a mountain and named it after her. Called it Mount Mrs. Oswald Tregenis. <laughs> <laughs> and so, in other words, if you, if you try to possess people and you make your sexual passion possessive, that way, then of course you are trying to cling to the physical world. But you see, women are in a way much more interesting if you don't cling to them, if you let them be themselves and be free. And uh, in, in my opinion, you can have a very spiritual sex life if you are not possessive. But if on the other hand you are possessive, then you're in trouble. So. Uh, but you know, the average Swami won't agree with that because he confuses, he, by thinking that the body, the body that I touch, is something evil. He's hung up with it. It's like the story of the two Zen monks who were crossing a river. And uh, it was uh, the ford was very deep because of the flood. And there was a girl trying to get across. And one of the monks immediately picked her up, threw her over his shoulder and carried her across, put her down on the other side, and then they, the monks went one way and she went another. And uh, the other monk had been in a kind of embarrassed silence, which he finally broke, and he said, do you realize that you broke a monastic rule by touching and picking up a woman like that? And he said, oh, but I left her on the other side of the river and you're still carrying her. <laughs> that uh, the, the, even you can find this to some extent in some rather irritable saint Paul uh, where he speaks of the opposition of the flesh and the spirit 
Now, this word, sox, in Greek, the flesh, as he uses it, is, is, a, is really, as Berjaev points out, it's a spiritual category. For the Christian, you see, the word is made flesh in Christ, and uh, there will be the resurrection of the body in the final consummation of the universe. So you cannot really, in, uh, as an orthodox Christian, take an uh, antagonistic attitude to the flesh. Why then does St. Paul take an antagonistic attitude to the flesh? Well, you can only save the situation and make the New Testament consistent with itself by saying that he meant by the flesh a, a certain kind of spiritual category. He didn't mean this, because this isn't flesh. Flesh is a concept. This is not. And so the flesh, or you might say, we talk about the sins of the flesh, they have entirely to do with certain hang-ups that we have about our, our bodies. And that again is what I would call leaning on the world, exploiting it. When you take, as a Buddhist, you take the third precept, Kame sumi chachara vermani sikapadam samandiyami. And it's usually translated, I undertake the precept to refrain from adultery. It doesn't say anything of the kind. Karma is passion. Kame sumi chachara, therefore, is, I undertake the precept not to exploit the passions. So, in other words, uh, you, you, you may be bored, you see and you're feeling sort of empty and at a loose end, and you think, well, um, I don't know, let's go and commit adultery. It might liven things up, see? <laughs> and, and that would be uh, what they call in Zen, raising waves when no wind is blowing. <laughs> it would be quite a different matter if uh, in a perfectly spontaneous and natural way, uh, you, uh, fell in love with some woman, uh, you, you wouldn't be going out of your way to get in trouble. It would be appropriate and natural at the time. Or in the same way, a lot of people, uh, instead of saying, let's commit adultery, when they feel sort of bored, they say, let's go and eat something. And so they become fatter and fatter and fatter because they're filling the spiritual vacuum in their psyche with food, which doesn't do the job. It's not the function of food to fill spiritual vacuums. So, uh, in, in this way, one exploits the appetites or the passions. Uh, so, likewise, also, the, the fifth precept, Sura Meriya Majapamadatana, uh, is the list of intoxicating substances. And uh, it doesn't say that you are not going to take them. It says you're not going to be intoxicated by them. In other words, a Buddhist may drink, but not get drunk. Uh, I don't know how that applies to psychedelics, but that's another story. So, one might say then that we are confused through and through about what we mean by the material world. And what I'm first of all doing is I'm just giving a number of illustrations which show how confused we are. And let me repeat this to get it clear, because it is rather complicated. In the first place, we confuse uh, abstract symbols, that is to say numbers and words and formulae, with physical events, as we confuse money with consumable wealth. In the second place, we confuse physical events, the whole class and category of physical events, with matter. But matter, you see, is an idea, it's a concept. It's the concept of stuff, of something solid and permanent that you can catch hold of. Now, you just can't catch hold of the physical world. The physical world is the uh, most evasive, elusive uh, process that there is. It will not be pinned down. 
and therefore it fulfills all the requirements of spirit. So what I'm saying then is that the, 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 the non-abstract world, which Kozhebsky called unspeakable, which was really a rather good word, um, <laughs> is the spiritual world. And the spiritual world isn't something kind of gaseous, abstract, formless, in that sense of shapeless. It's formless in another sense. The formless world is the wiggly world. There really is no way that the physical world is. In other words, the, the nature of truth, I said in the beginning, somebody had said that thoughts were made to conceal truth. This is, this is the fact, because there is no such thing as the truth that can be stated. In other words, ask the question, what is the true position of the stars in the Big Dipper? Well, it depends where you're looking at them from. And there is no absolute position. So in the same way, uh, accountants, a good accountant will tell you that any balance sheet is simply a matter of opinion. Uh, there's no such thing as the true state of affairs of a, of a business. But we're all hooked on the idea that there is, you see, an external objective world, which is a certain way. And that there, it really is that way. History, for example, is a matter of opinion. Uh, history is an art, not a science. It's something constructed which is accepted as a more or less satisfactory explanation of events, which, as a matter of fact, don't have an explanation at all. Most of what happens in history is completely irrational. But people always have to feel that they've got to find a meaning. For example, you get sick, and uh, you've lived a very good life, and uh, you've been helpful to other people, and done all sorts of nice things, and you get cancer. And you say to the clergyman, why did this have to happen to me? And you're looking for an explanation, and there isn't one. It just happened that way. But people feel if they can't find an explanation, they feel very, very insecure. Why? Because they haven't been able to straighten things out. The world is not that way. So the truth, in other words, what is going on, is, of course, a lot of wiggles. But uh, the way it is is always in relation to the way you are. In other words, however hard I hit a skinless drum, it will make no noise. Because noise is a relationship between a fist and a skin. So in exactly the same way, light is a relationship between electrical energy and eyeballs. It is you, in other words, who evoke the world, and you evoke the world in accordance with what kind of a you you are, what kind of an organism. One organism evokes one world, another organism evokes another world. And so everything, reality, is, is, is a kind of relationship. So, once one gets rid of the idea of the truth as some way the world is in a fixed sense, say, it is that way, see? Then you get to another idea of the truth altogether. The idea of the truth that cannot be stated, the truth that cannot be pinned down. And then that is the kind of truth that is God. When we speak of God as the... Uh, reality that exceeds all thoughts, that surpasses all definitions, that is infinite, unbounded, eternal, immeasurable in terms of time. That's what we're talking about. We're not talking about a gaseous vertebrate or a huge, uh, vast void without any wiggles in it. All gas. another way altogether, the truth that cannot be pinned. Well now in the first talk I was explaining that the theme of this seminar was the problem of how thoughts protect us from truth.
what to do about it. Showing various ways in which the symbolizing process, which we call thinking, the use of signs, words, symbols, numbers, to represent what's going on in the external world or the world of nature, leads us into a curious confusion that we confuse the symbolic process with the actual world. And the temptation to do this arises from the extraordinary relative success that we have had in controlling the world of nature with the power of thought. But I don't know if it's ever struck you that we really don't know whether we have successfully controlled it or not. Uh, it could be argued, a very strong case could be made, that the entire intellectual venture of civilization has been a ghastly mistake. And that we are now on a collision course. And that all the vaunted benefits of intelligence, technology, and all that, is simply going to draw the human race to an extremely swift conclusion. Of course, that might not be a bad thing. I've sometimes speculated on the idea that all stars have been created out of planets. And that these planets developed high civilizations, which eventually understood the secrets of nuclear energy and naturally blew themselves up. And in the process, these stars flung out lumps of rock as they blew up, which eventually spun around them and became planets in, in, all over again. And that this is the actual uh, method of genesis of the universe, uh, which would accord, of course, with the Hindu cosmology, where it is, uh, where time, and the events in time are invariably looked upon as a process of progressive deterioration through the cycles of each cowper in which things get worse and worse as time goes on until it can't stand itself anymore and it blows up and after a period of rest and recuperation begins all over again. Why do we somehow have a distaste for a theory of time which runs in that direction? I mean, would you rather have a rhythm that goes or the one that goes See, I mean, which is it? <laughs> uh, or do you, you, you want one that's going up always? You see? Or always getting better. You, you, can't, uh, you can't even imagine such a state of affairs. Because, uh, you know, it's relative. As you succeed in life, you simply... Uh, well, there was a communist, um, a Russian, not a communist, a Russian philosopher who accused the communists in their various five-year plans and progressive notions, wherein people were always preparing for tomorrow, of converting all human beings into caryatids. Now, you know, a caryatid is a pillar shaped in a human form which supports uh, a roof. And he said, you are turning all men into caryatids to support a stage upon which others will dance. But of course, uh, you know they never will. You have one row of caryatids supporting a floor, and very soon your children are the next row of caryatids supporting another floor, uh, so that it gets higher and higher, and, but we don't really know where we began, and we're always in the same place, always hoping, always thinking that uh, the, the next time will be it. And this, of course, is an eternal illusion. It's much better. Actually, one would be much happier to think that there is, the future is simply uh, deteriorating. I can explain that very simply. Human beings uh, are largely engaged 
in wasting enormous amounts of psychic energy in attempting to do things that are quite impossible. You know, as the proverb says, you can't lift yourself up by your own bootstraps. But recently, I've heard a lot of references in just general reading and listening, where people say, we've got to lift ourselves up by our own bootstraps. And you can't. And you can struggle and tug and pull till you're blue in the face, and nothing happens except that you've exhausted yourself. All sensible people, therefore, begin in life with two fundamental presuppositions. You are not going to improve the world, and you are not going to improve yourself. You are just what you are. And uh, once you have accepted that situation, you have an enormous amount of energy available to do things that can be done. And everybody else looking at you from an external point of view will say, my God, how much so-and-so has improved. <laughs> but I know, uh, I mean, hundreds of my friends are at work on enterprises to improve themselves by one religion or another, one therapy or another, they, this system, that system, and I'm desperately trying to free people from this. And I suppose that makes me a messiah of some kind. But the thing is that you, you, uh, <laughs> you can't do it. For one very simple reason, uh, which I think most of you are by now familiar with, is that the part of you which is supposed to improve you is exactly the same as that part of you which needs to be improved. <laughs> In other words, there isn't any real distinction between bad me and good I, between the higher self, which is spiritual, and the lower self, which is animal. It's all of a piece. You are this organism, this integrated, fascinating energy pattern. And uh, as Archimedes said, um, give me a fulcrum and I will move the earth, but there isn't one. It's like, you know, betting on the future of the human race. Uh, if I were really smart, I would lay a bet that the human race will destroy itself because in practical politics one realizes that nothing is going to work out right. No candidate I've ever voted for ever won the election. So, uh, but the trouble is there's nowhere to place the bet. And so, since I can't place the bed anywhere, I'm involved in the world and uh, must perforce uh, try to see that it doesn't blow itself to pieces. But the, the thing, I once had a terrible argument with Margaret Mead. She was holding forth one evening on the absolute horror of the atomic bomb, how everybody should immediately spring into action and abolish it. But she was so, uh, she was getting so uh, furious about it that I said to her, you know, you scare me because I think you're the kind of person who will push the button uh, in order to get rid of the other people who were going to push it first. <laughs> and she told me that I had no love for that my future generations, uh, no responsibility for my children, and I was a phony swami who believed in retreating from facts. But I maintain my position. Robert Oppenheimer, a little while before he died, said that it's perfectly obvious that the whole world is going to hell. The only possible chance that it might not is that we do not attempt to prevent it from doing so. <laughs> because you see, yeah, all the troubles going on in the, on in the world now are being supervised by people with very good intentions. Uh, their, their attempts to, to keep things in order, to clean things up, uh, to forbid this and prevent that possible uh, horrendous damage. And the more we try, you see, to put everything to rights, the more we make fantastic messes. And it gets worse. And maybe that's the way it's got to be. Maybe I shouldn't say anything at all about the folly of trying to put things to 
the right. But simply on the principle of Blake, let the fool persist in his folly so that he will become wise. This is an argument against all kinds of do-gooding. In other words, it's simply, it's, it's the, I'm, what I'm saying is, uh, don't take me too seriously. Uh, <laughs> I'm, I'm pitching a case for the fact that the civilization has been a mistake. That it would be much better to leave everything alone. That uh, the wild animals are wiser than we in that they, putting it in our crude and not very exact language, they just follow their instincts. And if a moth uh, mistakes a flame for the signal on which it gets a mating call and flies into the flame, so what? That just keeps the moth population down. And the moth doesn't worry. You know, it doesn't go buzzing around in a state of anxiety, wondering whether uh, this sex call is the, the real thing or just a flame. It doesn't think consciously about the future. At least we suppose this is so. Maybe it does, but we suppose that it doesn't. And therefore, it isn't troubled. And, uh, but the species of moths goes on and on and on. And it's, so far as we know, it's been around for an incredibly long time. And maybe even longer than we have. Bees, ants, creatures of this kind, they have long since escaped from history, so far as we can see. In other words, they live a settled existence, which you might consider rather boring, because it doesn't have constant change uh, in the way that we do. They live the same rhythm again and again and again and again, but because they don't bother to remember it consciously, it, doesn't, it never gets boring. And because they don't bother to predict, they never in a state of anxiety. And yet they survive. Now we, who look before and after, as Emerson says, and predict, and are always concerned whether this generation is going to be better or worse than the one that came before, we are tormented. And we just don't realize, because of this tremendous preoccupation with time, we don't realize how beautiful we are, in spite of ourselves. Because you see, the, the conscious radar is a troubleshooter. It's always on the watch out for variations in the environment which may uh, bring about disaster. And so our consciousness is from one day's end to another entirely preoccupied with time and with planning and with what has been and with what will be. And since troubleshooting is its function, we then get the general feeling that man is born to trouble. And we ignore in this preoccupation with conscious attention how marvelously we get on. How for most of the time our physical organs are in a fantastically harmonious relationship. How uh, our body relates by all sorts of unconscious uh, responses to the physical environment. So that if you became aware of all the adjustment processes that are being managed spontaneously and subconsciously by your organism, you would find yourself in the middle of great music. And of course, this occasionally happens. Well, the mystical experience is nothing other than becoming aware of your true physical relationship to the universe. And you're amazed, thunderstruck, by the feeling that underneath Everything that goes on in this world, the fundamental thing is a state of unbelievable bliss. Well, why not? Why else would there be anything happening? Because if the game isn't worth the candle, if the universe is basically nothing but a tormented struggle, why have one? Hasn't it ever struck you 
that it would be much simpler not to have any existence. It would require no effort. There would be no problems. So why is there anything going on? Uh, let me say not why, but how is there anything going on? Because if it's all fundamentally a drag, I just don't see any reason for its being. Everything would have committed suicide long ago and to be at rest. Abu Ben Adhem may his tribe decrease by cautious birth control and be at peace. <laughs> 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 so, uh, we might work on this possibility then. That civilization is a mistake. And that uh, we've taken completely the wrong track. We should have left things to nature, as it were. And of course, this is the same problem that is brought up in the book of Genesis. Uh, actually, the, the fall of man in Genesis is his venture into technology. Because in the Bible, the Hebrew words for the knowledge of good and evil are connected with techniques. What is technically expeditious and what is not. Words connected with actually metallurgy. And to be as God, you see, when you eat of the fruit of the tree of knowledge and you become as God, means you think you're going to control your own life. And God says, okay, baby, you wanted to be God, you try it. <laughs> but you, the, the trouble with you is you've got a one-track mind. And uh, therefore you can't be God. To be God, you have to have a uh, infinitely many-track mind, which is, of course, what your brain has, you see. The brain is infinitely many-tracked, but consciousness is not, it's one-tracked. As we say, you can th only think of one thing at a time. And you cannot take charge of the universe with that kind of a consciousness, because there's too much of it. As I explained before, too many variables. And our science can take care of a few variables or of an enormous number of variables, as in uh, quantum mechanics, by statistical methods. As we can use statistical methods to predict that uh, most people will live to be 65 years old, at least, but we cannot say of any given individual whether he will live to 65 or not. That's what we wanted to know. But the problem is that the variables on each individual are too complicated. And we have not yet, you see, developed a science which can deal with, say, 50, 100, or 500 variable systems. It's too complicated to think about. The computers are going to help us. But uh, as yet, we're either on the low number or the extremely high number. And they, these are outside the range of the problems with which we are really concerned. That's why, for example, a lot of people have taken to using the I Ching, the Book of Changes. Because if you're tossing a coin to make your decisions, and everybody does fundamentally make their decision by tossing coins, it's better to have a 64-sided coin than a two-sided coin. The I Ching gives you 64 uh, possibilities of uh, approach to any given decision instead of just two, yes or no. It's based on yes or no, because it's based on the yang and the yin. But uh, in the same way that uh, computers, digital computers, use a number system which consists only of the figures zero and one, out of which you can construct any number. And this was invented by Leibniz, who got it from the Book of Changes. It's amazing how uh, this book is somehow always with us. But this then is a, a, a way of um, arriving, of helping your own 
uh, multivariable brain arrive at decisions, cooperating with your own mind. Because then again, after you've tossed your 64-sided coin, the, uh, the oracle that you read that explains each particular hexagram in the Book of Changes uh, is a sort of Rorschach blot. It is a very laconic remarks into which everybody reads just exactly what they want to read. But that helps you make a decision by the fact that you don't really have to accept responsibility for it. See, then you can say, it told me. I consulted the oracle. Same way when you go to a guru. You say, my guru is very wise and he has instructed me to do this, this, that and the other. But it was you who decided on this guru. How did you know he was a good one? See, you gave him his authority because you picked him out. It always comes back to you. But we like to um, pretend it doesn't. But the thing is that uh, oneself is certainly not the stream of consciousness. Oneself is everything that goes on underneath that. And of which the stream of consciousness is a mere, uh, well, it has about the same relation to oneself as the bookkeeping does to a business. And if you're selling grocery, there's very little resemblance between your books and uh, what you move over your shelves and counters. There's just a record of it. And that's what our consciousness keeps. Now, supposing then we, we, we work with the argument that we've made an awful mistake in bringing out civilization and we're not going to survive. Now, there are various things that can be said about this. Just as I made the joke that uh, all stars used to be planets, one could say, well, is it such a good thing to survive? You know T.S. Eliot's wasteland where it says this is the way the world ends not with a bang but a whimper but some people would rather end with a bang than a whimper some people are stingy and they like to burn up their fire very gradually conserving the fuel and just keep enough heat going so that they get a long time other people prefer a kind of a potlatch situation where they have a huge whiz-bang fire that goes out in a hurry. Now, who is right? Do you want to be a tortoise? You know, the tortoise that lives for hundreds of years but drags itself around all the time, very slow, 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 solemn. Or would you rather be um, some uh, little hummingbird? Yeah, yeah, hummingbird, that's the thing. See, that dances and lives at a terrific pace. Well, you can't say one is right and the other's wrong. And so there may be nothing wrong with the idea of a world, a civilization, a culture that lives at a terrific increasing pace of change and then explodes. That may be perfectly okay. My point is that if we could reconcile ourselves to the notion that that is perfectly okay, then we would be less inclined to push that button. It's the anxiety. If you cannot stand anxiety, and if you cannot um, simply be content for issues to be undecided, you are liable to push the button because you say, let's get it over with. People who have trouble with the law and are um, manipulating the courts in one way or another. Always learn to delay everything. Put it off. Introduce legal red tape. Manage to, like uh, Ralph Ginsburg, who's been uh, in trouble because of the Eros magazine.
He's got a very smart attorney who simply, although the case has gone to the Supreme Court, he's simply mumbling away and putting up all sorts of things so that he keeps Ralph out of jail. And that's life. Life is simply a way of postponing death. <laughs> Uh, and that's, that, that's what we have to do. So then, uh, let's say, well, civilization wasn't really a mistake. It was just as natural as anything else. Uh, a, a being that exists under conditions of illusion, that imagines that it's controlling its own destiny, that thinks it's capable of improving itself. And by virtue of this illusion, uh, destroys itself rapidly in an interesting way. You see? Let's suppose that's what we are. But you still come back to the point that uh, you are spending an enormous amount of energy in doing things that can't be done. That is to say, tugging at the bootstraps. And if you find this frustrating, if you really don't like it, you don't have to do it. You could stop. And the paradox is that when you stop, you become happier and more energetic. People always wondered about the Calvinists, because Calvinists believed that from the beginning of time, God had foreordained who was to be saved and who was to be damned. And you have no choice, predestination. Therefore, the logical assumption would be that people who believed in predestination would be uh, laissez-faire. They're just sit and wait. So there's nothing we can do about it. But Calvinists were quite other than that. They were very energetic people, too energetic. Very, uh, very vigorously moral. They gave us the Protestant ethic. But they believed in predestination. Because you see, they simply had all the psychic energy which Catholics were dissipating upon wondering whether they were saved or not, see? And being in a state of fear and trembling about, have I made the right decision? Did I act rightly? 